We had, it wasn't the original plan, but we stopped uh, the project in its tracks and we redid it. Oh yeah? Um, there were too many deck levels. It was too shallow. There wasn't enough uh, room in the, in the cellar deck. And the folks who'd set up the, the model originally didn't even bother to look at um, the, I guess the design basis which clearly show the different modules. So here in module 22, for example, that was a utility module. Uh, you've got mud module 18, 23 was drilling, 11 the derrick, that was subcontracted out to DoTag. There was the drilling support module, that was DoTag, flare, uh, this whole architectural area, 37, those are living quarters, the helipad, and so what well, I... Well, did you guys inherit a feed from somebody else? Is that, is that what happened? There was a study that was done by uh, Acker. Okay. And I have to say the people that came before me, the, our predecessors were there for a few months. Uh, they were inspired by a previous project called Sackland. And uh, we were told when we joined the Hebron, not to mention the word Sackland, excellent because it was a bit of a fiasco. Um, so what I did is I went back and uh, insisted uh, with the uh, CAD support folks that we were gonna redo this and we were gonna redo all the naming. They had all the, all the models they had were all by deck level. And so what I wanted to do was uh, process inspired and construction driven. So these modules were gonna be broken up by their process, just as Acker had uh, done in their, you know, pre-feed study. Um, so, so this is kind of the culmination of that. So you can see we've got the different uh, elevations. So UL one, two, three, four, five. So this was the process module, this is the utility module, this is architectural levels. And so that was kind of the plan moving forward. Um, then we created a model index for each one of those sites that you see. There's a model that represents each one of these, uh, each one of these uh, process areas, process levels, and disciplines. And so for those that are not familiar with a model index, we had in the order about 330 uh, models or modules. So models and modules are interchangeable. They represent pretty much the same thing. Okay, so when 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 you're saying construction module, those are can be built independently elsewhere and brought to site. So right. the model matches the module exactly ideally well yeah how else could you do it <laughs> right Think so it. people say well is it a model uh, index or is it a module index well it, they're both it's interchangeable the, the yeah. model represents the module and so in pdms each one of these models uh, is put together and each one of these models are broken not only uh, by by the model or the module itself, but broken out by discipline. So electrical, piping, structural, each have their own model. But they, they, they. so why, why do we need a model index? Um, on offshore modules can get very complex and need to be managed closely. Um, and, by, and also I should point out that this was probably one of the most closely monitored projects in terms of progressing like I, I've ever seen. I mean, it seems like the bigger and more complex it is, the, the more, you know, management would monitor it with surgical precision. It was pretty good. Yeah, you it don't means want... identifying specific areas of a design for each discipline. Uh, a model index represents more than just the module, it represents each discipline, a contribution to a specific area a specific module and the model index also provides a structure for not only the design but for costing progress management management and reporting so this is a 
typically what the model index would look like. So we'd have our, our discipline code. So that's architectural, the module, this was the living quarters, the utility. So you got all these different, and the file name here represents the actual model in, in 3D and a little bit of representation. I could go into more details in this if you want, but this is pretty accurate in that it was broken down. You could, you could filter out the areas and find out who's responsible for it. I mean. Uh, How many leads did you have on that for piping? Oh, for piping, uh, I would say a good, a good dozen. Uh, leads, hold on. Well, we had one. Let's, let's, let's go back. So for piping, we had uh, a lead for the cellar deck, a lead for the uh, main process area. We had a lead for drilling. Uh, the one lead we had, okay, we had two leads in drilling, well, drilling support and drilling. Mud module and Derek, they were separated out by two leads. Um, utility module, that was uh, one lead also. And there's really little piping in, in it. And that was basically Newfoundland was taking care of that. So it gives you, you know, how many, how much is that? Like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven eight leads, but then each all had about four designers under. So, okay. so uh, would you say that's, well, I was going to say, would you say that's a bit bigger than a typical SAG D? But I guess oh, yeah. it's kind of hard to. It, it is bigger and it's um, a lot more, uh, I guess, uh, engaging. Well, how, how many, I guess the one thing that I always thought about the offshore is that uh, I've never done it, so I don't know, but I, I always imagined that there would be fewer commodities or process fluids than, let's say, a refinery, obviously. There is, there is. But, it's but basically, you... there's no process. The process really is separation of uh, water, oil, and gas. And what you see on the process module is, is broken up in, in that fashion. So at the bottom, you, you've got your, so the main process area is probably at level three. Um, so separation between two and three. So you got all your, your water collects at the bottom. So all your, your whole drainage, basically everything that's the crud, the, what we call the, the slops, they go right in the cellar deck. Um, oil is separated from the water, and then the gas is separated. So as you go up in level, it, it kind of follows with the, uh, I guess the density of the fluids. Sorry to interrupt you, William, while, while you're in the middle of explaining something that I just asked you, <laughs> but could you maybe call up an image for people who don't have a clue of what we're looking at? Do you have an image of the top side somewhere, a picture? That you could just pull up real quick so that people can say, "Oh, that's what that thing represents." Yeah, I was. I, I'm going to get there. Oh, okay. Uh, I got oh, a lot no. more to show you. I got lots. Okay, okay. So, so this was the, this was the. I just want to talk about the model index, how we get there, and and here's uh, here's yeah. the 3D model. Uh, so we were planning on building this. So at this point, this is what we think we're getting. Um, and so I was talking about the, this area here and, and we can do a walkthrough too. I mean, I got, I got Navis set up. Oh, good. Yeah. Cool. One big deal was clashes. Uh, Hebron at its peak had 90,000 clashes. When you get a module this complex, clashes uh, are everywhere. And people not familiar with design development were very concerned yeah. with uh, the clashes. Some of the questions were asked well. Um, we're not finished yet. <laughs> Why are we modeling with clashes? Why not simply model without clashes to begin with? 
Uh, last week, you had 90,000 clashes. This week, you still have 90,000 clashes. When do you plan on resolving them? Uh, we are just simply unfrozen caveman project engineering managers. We do not understand these complex things you call clashes. Please rid of them as soon as possible. So clash detection and resolution, right. Clashes are inevitable part of design development. So why are they? Uh, the 3D design development begins with conceptual design. Each discipline provides their best design for what their mandate is. Uh, discussion and ideas need to be communicated and exchanged between design disciplines to accommodate each discipline's objective. Uh, when clashes occur, some designs for some disciplines will take priority over others. And finally, you know, when the design needs to be proven and engineered to code, that's when the real fun begins because things start morphing, you know, you get bigger, smaller, more complex uh, engineering. You, know, you need to design the thing to code and things change. So how are they detected and resolved? Uh, 3D CAD systems provide reports on all clashes. The trick is to prioritize them. You know, we got minor clashes and we got important ones. At the early stages of design, soft clashes are not an issue. Focus needs to be done on hard clashes. Soft clashes would be, say, you want uh, one inch clearance between the insulation and the steel. Well, now you're clashing because you're, you only got a half inch clearance or you want one inch clearance between steel and pipe or, or between steel and equipment. Or a valve and handle. Now you got, or valve handles interfering into a designated walk. Right, designated. so these are not, or even uh, volumes. You know, we've got our, our, uh, our decks are just got pathways full of access volumes. And sometimes you'll have something clashing in the access volume. Well, uh, operation volume, access volume, um, clashing with, like you said, a hand wheel, that's a soft clash. Hard clash would be, you know, anything from steel with steel, steel with pipe, uh, a physical clash. It could be as little as an eighth of an inch uh, to, to three inches, you know. So what in other words, in other words, pipe is running through steel or vice versa. Or, right. Yeah. Or trays. I mean, piping is not yeah. the only concern here. There's there's every discipline gets uh, reported on on their clashes. So a priority matrix is usually the good place to start when you've got 90,000 clashes. Uh, and weekly reports are generated by the software and filtered by the design coordinator. And it's typically issued to all the discipline leads and management. So this is a typical uh, priority matrix. You'll see, say, piping clashing with, uh, you know, say, major equipment. Well, the major equipment's going to rule. Well, piping's clashing with HVAC, 36 inch diameter. Well, guess what? Sorry, man. HVAC rules. Um, Big 36 inch uh, ducting is not easy to route. Uh, you might not think it's important because piping's got the process and we're, we're more important, but you know, uh, you wanna keep the place cool or warm. Yeah, so these on, all represent it, the, the- It depends on which would cost more to fix, right? Or, and which is more difficult, right? So like you got primary steel right here, primary steel rules pretty yeah. much on everything. Yeah. You're not going to mess with primary steel. And if you got a primary steel clash with a major equipment, big X, yeah. mitigation required, solution needs to be found. Let's see the clash responsibility matrix. So when you got something major equipment or piping, and there's an X in there, that's that's so here's a responsibility matrix. If you've got structural and, and equipment, piping is going to have to deal with it. If you got HVAC with structural, well, HVAC is going to deal with the solution. So the solution, you try to accommodate the other discipline as much as you can, but if you can't, you're responsible for mitigating the solution. You're, so, so that's 
So sometimes you, you got to play hardball, and sometimes you do the best you can. In Aviva, this is a typical uh, example of a clash report. I had to create a little go by for whoever would be running these besides myself in the event that I go on vacation and they fire my ass, they need a backup plan, you know? So this, this was kind of an explanation. It's just a, a sample. And this is a PDMS output. So you filter this through and, whoops. I shouldn't have done that. I clicked on the hyperlink. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, here's the hyperlink. Back to that. Some examples of a clash. Here we got steel clashing with a shoe. And uh, well, you have to recognize what's valid and what's not. Here's a typical report where you've got uh, the utility module level two north. Uh, and this is electrical, say elbows and elbows and branches are basically trays clashing with subframe. And so that's what a typical thing like that would look like. This is the pivot table that shows uh, all the different areas, cellar, lower, main, upper, different, you know, disciplines. Uh, this is great for really narrowing down uh, the different areas. Um, it's just a, a crazy wacky graph showing the trends. You, you can see that uh, between 10th of January and March, We've got active clashes that are kind of going all over the map, but going down uh, new clashes, unapproved clashes. So total unapproved clashes, you know, the, the break between hard, 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 soft, uh, close out. So there's a trend that's closing out. And that was just to give a big picture to keep some people uh, at ease that we're actually progressing in the right direction. Uh, where this, this happened in Bullarm and in and Korea, those two places. So the dry dock in Newfoundland, 1985, dry dock, 2013. Um, so you can see they've actually closed out part of that bay. And this is a Google Earth image of, of the construction in the dry dock. So here's the, here's another view of that. And this is huge. If you can imagine, uh, you can see some guys here standing around. This is massive. That's what you call the gravity base, is it? Yeah, that's the gravity base. Acker was uh, tasked at uh, building that. And so the idea is, is you got all these rebar sticking out and they're pouring concrete. And um, when it becomes tall enough, they flood the uh, dry dock and they'll dig out all that soil they put in place and they'll tow it out to a, to a deeper spot. So this thing will actually float, which is amazing. <laughs> this this dis displaces more than its own weight in water and that's what allows it to float. So they only need to float about three feet above the bottom. And, and uh, so then they'll tow this out to the site and continue drop forming. So, so they basically have a floating support structure and they pour concrete, let it dry and then drop it. And, and it's like, I guess, forming candles. I don't know, it's just, uh, it's formed from the top down and drop form until it takes on its final shape. So is this, uh, this doesn't sit on the sea floor, does it? Or is it, it, it does eventually. Oh, it, it does will eventually. actually physically sit on the sea floor. It okay. does, it does. So the whole gravity base uh, structure is about a hundred meters tall in 80 meters of water. And it does float with the top sides up to 250 miles off the coast of Newfoundland. So at one point, the top sides will mate with the gravity base 
and they will float it out. They will float it out, you know, whatever millions of tons they got, they'll float it out to the site. So, <clears throat> meanwhile, back in Busan, Korea, this is uh, all the modules that are starting to get built uh, in their yard. They had several other projects going simultaneously. It is definitely, I mean, you look at the cranes here on rails. Uh, this was definitely a world-class uh, shipbuilding facility. It, the size is is mind-boggling. Okay, so that that you that <laughs> what you just pointed out there is that orange or red? I can't tell on color. Yeah, it's orange. That's, here. that's one leg. <laughs> yeah, a gantry crane. Right, and you don't you can't even see the top of it, and you can't. No, see the other and one. and and it's on a rail track. It's on a. It's got two railroads. So it's spread over two railroads, and there's about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Ah, there's about 16 wheels on each side of this uh, support. It's just it's unbelievable. And here you can see it in the background there. Uh, so, so here's the, the top sides being assembled. So they've got uh, bits and pieces uh, being built uh, at the ground level. <clears throat> they do as much as they can. And then they raise it up and put it on top and continue working on it. So they try to do as much at the ground level as they can. This is part of another project, but you all, you'll recognize this in a minute. Um, so th this is part of the, the drilling module. There's a part of the drilling module that's being put in place and being dropped on the top there. You can see that big X. That, that big X is actually holding the entire top sides together. <laughs> it's pretty, uh, <clears throat> um, we'll, we'll get into that later, but it's, it's impressive. Um, yep. So th this was called the, um, the Goliath. That rolled plate you saw eventually would be part of this. Um, you can see the, escape pods here. These are sacrificial anodes. They're about 12 feet tall. This thing floats like a plug in the, in the ocean, bobs around. And these are living quarters here. This, this is, uh, was a pretty big floating structure. And dockwise, the ship that took it out is the same ship that, uh, would take out the top sides module. And there's a whole grillage, they call it grillage, where they reinforce the hull and, and the base of this ship to take on this module. And this ship will sink all the way up to probably the orange line so that you can actually float it in there, take it out. Dockwise, I think there's two of them in the world of that size. You can see some more bits and pieces being fabricated at the ground. So this was a gas-fired uh, generator that was brought to site, um, pre-fitted, make sure everything's fine. Just to give you an idea of the size, look at these, you know, the legs on this thing, it's just huge. So it's just being installed. And the next day it's up on top. You said, uh, where was that? Did you say Busan? Yeah, Busan. Okay. This was the gas compressor module. So basically they're collecting gas from the process, the uh, casing gas. Some of it gets re-injected back into the well to maintain pressure. Some of it is collected and stripped and clean and used for the gas fire generators, provide uh, fuel, fuel gas. The gas fire generators provide electricity on the whole thing. 
the boneyard is, you know, all the bits and pieces come together. That's the separator right there. That's gas separation, um, getting all assembled and uh, things starting to get in place. A lot of the piping uh, is not hooked up on some of these big pieces. They are, um, they're like slinged and held in position for the transport. And then, then the temporary uh, steel and temporary supports are taken out and put and then hooked up. So a lot of this stuff, they'll hook up, make sure it fits, and then, then they'll take it apart and put temporary supports on them because the trip back to Newfoundland is, is, is pretty wild. Uh, a, something of this structure, this size, this height, every, you know, half a degree of uh, angular uh, shift at the base of the ship represents maybe a, a six foot swing at the top. So somebody at the top could be thrown overboard simply on a, on a beautiful calm day just because of the height. Call this the Bigfoot. Uh, I'll show you, there's four of these supporting the entire top sides. Um, that guy standing in a bolt hole, that, that's literally one bolt hole, about two feet in diameter. Um, a two on the uh, right there. It, it essentially, the center of the whole module is, is being, supported by these four points and everything else is cantilevered out. So here are some pieces arriving at the bull arm site. There's a, there's the boom. That's a flare boom they're bringing in. That's a flare boom being stored. Here you have the derrick that's been prefab and shipped over. This is the drilling support module. So this was, this drilling support module was done in St. Mary's town in Newfoundland. This one was done, I believe in Korea as well, but it was uh, handled by DUTAC. Both of these were by DUTAC. You can see in the background here, the gravity base has been shipped to, uh, to another location where the deeper waters where they continue building and there's a lot going on inside that uh, at the centerpiece. I mean, it, basically they're floating tanks and the center is, uh, is just a corridor full of uh, drilled bits going through it. So here you see all the bits and pieces starting. To, and, and here in the background, these are the uh, living quarters that are being uh, fabricated in situ. Main module arriving. So they're going to skid this off the boat onto the finger pier. And you can see all the, the rigging from uh, Fagioli is getting ready to line themselves up to put in the first the drilling support module, which will be skidded over to the side. And then the derrick will be put there, putting it all together. So there's the Fagioli, um, you know, rigging. So they're going to take this, this drilling support module, line it up, raise this whole thing. And by that time, the module top sides will be sitting on these skids. This was probably the most precarious uh, rigging effort of the entire project. They had to elevate the uh, living quarters combined with heli deck and the escape pots, raise it up, skid it on a barge, and the barge had, once it was on the barge, it would be floated around to the other side and hooked up. And there it's getting ready to go. And, and I mean, this is precarious to say the least. You wanna do this on very calm waters. And here you see uh, 
Uh, how they hooked this up was pretty amazing. It's it's basically held up by two hooks, and supported on a on on two points. The, the hooks kind of grasped onto the to the module, and then it was slowly uh, dropped into on pins. Basically, they're on pins. This was on hooks, so they had like these huge guide pins uh, in the shape of a uh, of a cone, inverted cone. And then they weld them. Uh, this is they're showing the skidding here of the DSM. So now, yeah, this is uh, this is the top sides hooked up to the gravity base. So it was brought there, and there you go. Once that bit was completed, it was uh, shipped 250 miles off the coast, 250 kilometers, I think, off the coast, not miles, kilometers. And then you got first oil uh, 2015, I believe, 2016, 2015. So that was that. So all this time you were working out of Calgary, was it? Pardon me? Were you working out of Calgary for all this? No, I was in Houston. So I left Calgary in 2011 to work on this. Well, I remember you were, I forget, I think you were working on that when I was at Worley, or maybe that was another one. Because you and Dave had worked on uh, offshore, right? In Montreal. Right. So in Montreal, I was on the Hibernia project. Hibernia, and that was right. kind of what got me in on Hebron. So this is the top sides, this Hebron, uh, as it compares to the stadium of Montreal. Yeah, it's good. Many it's actually people, taller than the Montreal stadium. Many people won't know what that thing is on the right. It's uh, kind of a spaceship, but uh, probably more expensive than the spaceship. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good comparison. Where'd you get the model of the stadium? Uh, I found it online. Oh, yeah. So here, one of the, remember we were standing in one of the feet? One of the bolt holes there? One of the bolt holes, yeah. Okay. So that's what that is. This was, uh, this is the drilling. This is inside the, you know, the gravity base. Okay, what are we looking at there? Are those just piles? Or are those actual? No, those are this, those would actually be the the, the at the some drill, point, yeah. The drills that are drilling for the oil, right? Oh, okay. So you have uh, you have this contraption here that uh, basically drills, and once you once you've drilled, you install these uh, blow off preventers. So everything you, you see kind of ghosted our future. So what we did is we ghosted the future and we put what is active uh, for the project. And so here are the blow off preventers and each one of these basically goes all the way down. This is, this is still in the, let me see if I can get a, Get a wider perspective here. So this is where all the uh, operations is are operations for uh, you know that's five thousand psi. Mm -hmm. And so they line up with these uh, guides, and eventually uh, you're basically. You have a pump in here. Uh, this is, I got more recent, uh, you know, uh, walkthroughs than this. The whole point of this walkthrough is really to showcase the height, but uh, let's see.
this was all done with the uh, PDMS, right? Yes. Is that, yeah, that's before it became E3D? That's right. It was version, I guess we, we worked between 11 and 12, versions 11 and 12 for this project. So there was a lot of, all these volumes represent, uh, these ghosted images represent something uh, of significant importance, but it's not really part of the walkthrough uh, unless you want it to be. Depends what you're looking at. So this represents the, um, the rigging that was used to bring the flare boom into position. All these green boxes represent uh, swing object uh, studies. What, what would happen if, you're, if you got the crane and you're pulling a piece of pipe and it's swinging around? Uh, so, and you can see the ghosted images of the derrick the space it would occupy as it moves around on the deck, because what we're seeing is just one position on the deck. This really makes you appreciate how they were, how they did this before CAD came along. Can you, yeah, it had can to all be imagine? in your head. Can you imagine? You had to have a vision in your mind. So this was the uh, this is the grillage I was telling you about. This all this steel was basically welded to the dockwise uh, ship to reinforce it and to spread the load on this thing. And and you can see that these four support points is all that is in contact with the gravity base, and the rest is cantilevered on all sides. This big X here uh, is really holding holding it all together. I'm going to get rid of some volumes here. Um, let's see. Instructions. What we did on this as well, where possible, we tried to get the 3D model from the vendors. And so we incorporated their models in, in this as well. What, what kind of hardware were you guys typically running at each workstation? Because uh, when you mentioned that getting the <laughs> vendor equipment models, I envision a regular eight by 10 pump uh, being 75 megabytes. You know, because they're not cleaned up, they're not shrink wrapped. How did you guys handle that with the huge amounts of memory for file sizes? Well, Navisworks is pretty good uh, for creating walkthroughs efficiently. Yeah. And that's also a reason why you want to break out the model into so many sub models. Oh, yeah. Right. Each the designer is not going to load up the entire thing, it'll grind down to a standstill. Yeah. In fact, I told I told our drilling folks because they bought a lot of shit. A lot of their stuff is purchased. It's not model, but they wanted to make it look like they were modeling it. Very impressive. But um, Ooh, we got a thing in, in PDMS called a deferred database, which is not part of the original when you try to, to segregate it. So all this equipment that we purchase, we put them in a deferred database. So if the designer wanted to see them, he could call it out separately. And so, yeah, there's, there's a lot of memory on the machines and the graphic cards are really pulling everything together. But this is, here is an example of something that was subcontracted out. In, in, um, let's see. Uh, oh, a hex plate exchange. I'm trying to. Oh, there we go. There we go. So this. This was subcontracted out, and this is a model that was given to us. I mean, you can see the, the intricacies. Yeah, that's going to be a huge. That's incredible. Um, so the models in blue were, were developed internally based on vendor drawings. The models in green are the ones that were provided for us to include in our walkthrough. And it allowed us to also 
um, do a walkthrough of the vendor's equipment. Mm -hmm. You know, see how it fits in to our interfaces. Does, yeah. does it clear our, our steel? It does, but not by much. And, you know, so. So all the, yeah, all the, all the green equipment. I think this was chemical injection. Yeah, look at the detail and the, the individual swage lock fittings and. Right, and all the gauges. Like, do I see bolts even? <laughs> yeah, 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 there's bolts, hold on. Let me show you some bolts. There's a hatch. It looks pretty, but it's, <laughs> it's a good thing you're able to turn it off while you're. Uh... Yeah, so this is for the walkthrough. And one of the tricks of, of, of making all this work in Navisworks is, is breaking down the uh, modules. So, so if I wanted to get rid of all the vendor stuff, I could just hide it all. Yeah. This is the top sides broken out into their individual modules. You can see the, the numbers um, very familiar from, from that first snapshot we had. And we can go to the, let's see, let's go to the, the Derrick. So this is, I just highlighted the Derrick. So this is the Derrick. It's uh, very complex. So you can imagine this thing, we had 52 wells. So basically this moves uh, north, south, east, west and lines itself up with each one of those, uh, uh, each one of those, uh, I guess, openings in the, in the drilling deck. So here's all the, this is where all the, the drilling fun is. And here you have, uh, this is where one of the operators hang out. And basically, if you're an operator, you're in here and you're looking down at what's going on over here. I mean, Look at the detail of this. It's pretty mm -hmm. crazy. <laughs> I guess it's good for VR training for the operators too. Well, we were able to bring all this, it, you know, there's a lot of discussions about operations and maintenance. So this becomes, you know, an invaluable tool to review your, your, your plan, what could go wrong, you know, how it's going to work, where the equipment is at. So this is over my head. I'm not into drilling, um, but the guys that that know this shit, they they review every piece of equipment. They review how it's going to work. They they address all the concerns uh, operationally, and it gives them a sense of uh, what they will be dealing with once this thing gets built. So yeah, you can see all these, these, these volumes showing, you know, obstruction volumes. So you have to, you have to be careful sometimes. You don't swing into say the living quarters <laughs> or the derrick or whatever. Um, so there are, these things are programmable so that you can set limits to them. So even through operator, operator air, uh, you won't accidentally uh, swing into something. So th those are all programmed in. Let's see if I can get rid of all these obstruction bonds. HHI. Have you shown this to uh, Carrie? Pardon me? Have you shown this to Carrie? No. Oh, she would love this. She was in offshores for many years, I think. Yeah, she well, said she'll, she'll see the, she'll see the video. 
She'll see the video. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out uh, where, if I can turn this off. Props. Oh, props. I think you can. Uh, yeah, yeah. I had it all under miscellaneous. Let me switch all this. Oh. I was going to say, so we had props everywhere. Right what you saw there were props. We had um, our, in the model, people like to use props, whether it's a guy standing around or, or whatever. Although they'll, they'll need to copy something over and use it later. So what we did is we assigned uh, datum point zero, zero, zero as a location for our, we called it the warehouse. So your, all your stuff that you need and you wanna copy and you wanna get back and you don't wanna clutter the model. You, you, we, I basically, I said, guys, put it in the warehouse, zero, 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 all your datum points. So you had this big blob of, of you know, 3D models of anything you can possibly imagine uh, at zero, zero, zero. And so if somebody needed to pick up uh, a prop or something, it, it, they would find it out there. And so it wasn't, obviously it was not part of a walkthrough, but it was part of the model uh, and it was under a particular site. So we wouldn't you know, mess things up. So it's, uh, It's pretty, as, it's pretty as, impressive. You imagine as the project progressed, the walkthroughs became more and more choppy. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. So, so we would we would uh, have to we I would prepare these these uh, these sections. So this is below cellar deck. So if you wanted to, you know, do a review. With everything that was below the cellar deck, well, this was it. And so here you have all your your, your drainage uh, system and, and all the drain pipe. And, and so this is what was going on below the cellar deck. You can you see the drilling area is pretty obvious. So that was so if you want to do a review drains uh, and make sure everything was sloped. Well, that's the other thing is, it's nice and flat here, but in actual fact, because it's being supported at four distinct points, the steel is actually bowing. And so uh, the structural folks are pretty sharp and they would kind of like a, like a low bed truck, it would curve the steel upwards. Oh, like so that, given it's in, in its own weight, would would fall flat. Yeah. And and also, also the uh, all the steel itself. If we looked at let's say let's let's. Uh, Oh, you, you need to buy one of those six thousand dollar video cards, Martin. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's actually uh, this machine I'm using is actually pretty close to what I was using on, on for model reviews. It's because you're looking at the big picture, but what, yeah. once you uh, yeah. once you get in there, well, I don't know if you're if you're if you're doing what you're doing now, the visualization. Does that benefit from parallel processing? Can you? You, can you speed it up if you had like a dual CPU machine or is everything still single? You know what I mean? It's just- It all raw. depends on the, the depth of field. So if you clip it closer, you're not gonna get this choppiness. Yeah, but, but as you put, see, if, when, once you're in there, it's not that choppy. And I mean, for the hardware itself, like in CAD, you, everything, you can't use parallel processing because the computer can't predict what the designer is going to do next. Okay, well, right? I, so the fastest CPU you can get is the best for CAD. Right. I'm wondering for visualization, since that that's already a file, right? You're not creating; you're just looking through it. I'm just wondering if uh, 
if you would benefit from having one of those, it's super expensive. Oh, you do, cards. you do. I mean, this this computer has eight processors. It has an NVIDIA graphic card, um, pretty high end. And and if it weren't for that, we see when you're doing a walkthrough, you're not running through anything. You're, just, you're yeah. pretty much going at this space, this pace. So the regeneration is is practically non-existent here. And this is this would be typical in a model review to expect this, you know, kind of speed up. You start seeing things being regenerated. My fan's going crazy now, so it is working overtime. Yeah. Hey, I wash. So I should be walking on the deck here and we should, so we would do this often is, is check out all the different levels. You can see all the volumes that are being used for uh, main access. So like I said, it gets, it gets choppy when uh, when you when you put everything in perspective, this is the cellar deck. Those are the separators you saw in one of the clips, one of the pictures. Lower deck. Lower deck mez. So we had mezzanines on this. So the, the, the difference between the, the levels were pretty high and we had intermediate mezzanines. This is uh this is the main deck. This is where gas separation occurs. Main deck mezzanine. It, it was, I have to say it was quite the challenge, but um, uh, how we had we... weekly, weekly model reviews that we oh. would iron out all the, you know, different disciplines. And how long were you on that? That was a few years, right? Yeah, 2011 to 2014. Yeah, three year project, that's, uh... yeah. So I also broke it up into different uh, modules. So it makes navigation a little easier as well. And besides when you're doing a walkthrough, you're not, you're not reviewing the entire uh, top size. You're, yeah. you're reviewing it yeah. by sections. So this is, this what you see here is the utility module area. And these are the, uh, these are, big ass pumps for firewater. So these are the firewater pumps. And this is your, all your emergency diesel generators. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So this was all diesel generators. So this is all firefighting equipment, basically, you know, all the water and firefighting. So module 22, cellar deck, 22, main deck, uh, HVAC and offices. Uh, LER, this is the uh, what the hell's LER again? I forgot the equipment room. So, I mean, I, 
the, the structure on this was, was absolutely amazing. There was one, at one point I isolated everything to do with, with uh, structural. And all you could see was just the structure. I wonder if I could still do that. Slash S. Hmm. Not sure if I can do it. This is the free version. I might not be able to. Oh, you don't have manage, right? I don't have the simulate. This is freedom. In simulate, you could you could select uh, like a wild card, and and you'd select just the steel, and you could see the the impressive uh, monument this is. Well, if you oh, okay in freedom, you can't. Uh, no, you select, can't. Select you, an you, item, you, and it'll tell you what. Uh, oh yeah, you can. So so what you can do is just I want to. Let's say I, I want to look at this. Uh, where's my big X? You got to switch to your uh, arrow cursor, I think. Right. So that's that's the that's the steel being called uh, out. Yeah, right that's, there. What saw, that's what we saw in the photo earlier, right? Right. And here's the pipe, the six-inch uh, pipe. You know. Uh, Go to the can, process. Can you right click on the cross there and maybe it will tell you? I don't know if freedom will do that. So you can, this is part of the site. So if I, if I was to say, pick this. Yeah, focus on item and then you can. So that gives me the site and, and the deck, but I, I could, let's see, you go to options, uh, interface, but the display. No. <laughs> Same thing with me. Every time I want to change a setting or Election. configuration, you go hunting for it and it's like, uh, uh, what I want to do, uh, quick properties, that's what it is. Definition. So in, are, you're in Houston now? Yeah. Okay. I'm heading back to Calgary at the end of November. So what you can do is you can pick and choose our uh, PDMS deck level item name, and, and you could, you know, all right, so I want to go to PDMS and you can pipe spec, you can put that in there, right? Get on another level and let's say, We'll pick uh, EMS and you can put insulation thickness. Um, say line sequence number. Where's size? Here we go. Size. So when you when you go there, then it tells you, oh, it's a 20 inch. That's the deck level and that's the spec. You know what I mean? Yep. So it so in a in a review, I'd have all these already preset so that when we stop on a pipe, we, we know what you know what we're looking at. So that's kind of what it is. Three years going through this. And it's a project that doesn't come along very often in a career, right? No, twice in mine. And uh, I don't think we had the uh, Navis Works back in 1991 when I was in Montreal. So it, was, it wasn't that. What were you using some built-in? What software were you using on that? It was MicroStation. 
and it was two mainframe servers basically okay well my just just vanilla microstation well microstation had uh no it had its 3d capabilities it was intergraph wasn't it, it wasn't microstation oh it was intergraph. Inter intergraph right uh so that would have been the would that have been pds yes because i i'm trying to remember back in 80 this would have been in 1991 92 with snc yeah i'm trying to remember back around that time on one project i was on they had the, the you know the big intergraph station with the 221 inch monitor that's exactly what it was the big oh, ass okay. monitors weigh 300 okay. pounds each okay uh had digitizer the um, big huge digitizer in the front the, the, yeah with the puck yeah they yeah, didn't have icons. That probably was PDS, I think. Or could have been because uh, PDS. I don't know. I thought PDMS it was MS has been around for a long time. And PDS is the is the is the precursor to uh smart plan, right? Yeah. But for a long time, PDS was the only game. You know what? It might have been PDMS. I don't remember. I don't I wasn't in uh, piping back in those days. I was in mechanics. Okay. So, uh, although I met some pipers back then, and I got to see them again. Uh, yeah, well, Dave Rogers was the was the piping lead, and uh, I met him for the first time on on Hibernia. Yeah, I still see his name pop up on uh, LinkedIn every now and then. Yeah, he's retired. He's not doing anything anymore. You put in too many hours, too many long days. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. A uh, real great guy. Uh, cut me my break uh, on Hebron. Really appreciate that. I liked working with him a lot. You know, he gave, he, he was a fair man, you know. He was, uh, give everybody a, a chance. And I liked working with him and I helped him a lot. So I guess that's kind of how I got in. Yeah. I used to be pretty good. Well, I still am pretty good with spreadsheets and reports. And so I used to help him out a lot with that. Yeah, he's, he's like old school. Like probably. Uh, right, right. And so less... I would automate shit for him. Like he just was stunned in disbelief. And loved yeah. It. And I did a lot of modularization, like for JCOS and all these studies. I did, you know, I did a lot of international um plot plans and layouts while I was with Worley in Calgary. That that was good exercise. I met some smart folks there and that really helped me out too. You know, working with these people, exchanging ideas. Did a lot. Yeah, it's interesting stuff. Yep. So that's that's uh, Hebron. Very interesting. Uh, I, if I could slice this thing. Let me see if I can. I'll see if I can slice, slice and dice. Wait, 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 wait. You. There's ah, enable sectioning. Yeah. So, what you can do with this, which is pretty cool. Yeah, I've never actually, I don't you think I've ever used a surface. I've ever used a section. Sure. You can pick a surface. See alignment from the top. You can also say align to surface. Boom. Now you've sliced the whole thing. And and you can move it. Let it regen. That's pretty cool. Yeah. You could add other slices. You could say, I'm going to add number two here. And number two, I'm going to align it. 
from say this surface. So you can move that up too. Very user-friendly software. I find it so intuitive. Yeah, I, it used to be called something else. I remember I bought a license many years ago when it was called- well, uh, PDS had its review, didn't it? Yeah, I've never used PDS. I don't know what it was called. Smart PDMS had their own reviewer as well. Yeah, uh, S3Z has their own reviewer. Yeah, it used to be but called- But nothing Trump compared to, to Navisworks. Navisworks yeah. is really the way to go. Yeah, it used to be called something else though. I just can't remember now. Romer, no, uh, Romer is the kernel, I think. If you look for it, it's romer.exe, right? I remember using PDS review or whatever it was, and it was nasty, it was horrible. Anyways, so that's that's the deal with that. Cool. So uh, I was thinking, um,